Hello, greetings everybody who is watching us. Welcome to Gaba Community Church live online Tuesday Bible study class. My name is Ronald Sajavoy, one of the pastors here. And it's a blessing again that I'll be sharing the word with you this wonderful, wonderful Tuesday evening. Or maybe you're watching this later in the morning or in the afternoon. Or maybe there's a time difference where you are. Here at Gaba Church, we love you, we appreciate you. And it's a blessing. If you're watching us, we want to thank you for just keeping on track with what we are sharing. Today, I want to pray as we're going to talk about prayer again and again and again. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to just spend time in your word. Thank you for the opportunity to learn about prayer and to learn about you. Lord, I pray that our hearts and our minds will be open and I pray, Lord, that you just give us a deeper spiritual insight into your word. And Lord, may you teach us how to pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've been doing a very interesting series for the past few weeks, or should I say now months. We started with a series on the sociological structure of cults. Then we progressively moved on to the aspect of spiritual warfare, which we've been teaching for the past four or five weeks. And then we're slowly transitioning to talk about prayer more and more. Because somewhere, somehow, we realize that in spiritual warfare, one of the key most important things that uh, tools that we use is prayer. Last sharing when I did, I talked a little bit about five aspects of prayer. I started first of all this whole prayer thing by talking about the place of prayer in spiritual warfare. And then I talk about five aspects of prayer. Do you remember those aspects? Will you be able to repeat them? Well, if you have been following, you should. I remember one of them was meditation. Another one was waiting. Another one was watching. And if you're listening, another one was fasting. I don't know if you spent time, you know, uh, another one was also listening. I don't know if you spent time listening or watching those sermons. In case you did not, you can go back on this page and scroll below and look for these videos and you find the teachings on prayer teachings on the arm of God, the teachings on cults, and also the teachings on spiritual warfare. Please be in tune with us. Today, we are going to talk about another part of prayer, or we're going to talk about prayer. Maybe this might, might, be, might be our conclusion of this part of prayer. But basically, today we are going to talk about how then should we pray. Because we've talked a lot about what prayer is. We've talked about what prayer is not. We've actually also talked a lot about um, the aspect of prayer. So today, we want to just address this aspect of how then should we pray? Now, this is a question that the disciples asked Jesus. And therefore, I just want to take you to Jesus' answer to their question and we analyze this a little bit. So if you are with us in this Bible study, I would love you to turn to the book of Matthew chapter 6. And we are going to read, uh, we'll read a few verses from there, but with special emphasis on verses 9. So, Come with us together in the word of God. I'm going to read from the NIV. Matthew 6 says, from verse 5, it says, When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received the reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans. Can you imagine? For they think they will be hard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. And he says, this then is how you should pray. Which is what we're going to talk about today. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors, okay? And lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Jesus starts this uh, beginning section of this chapter with talking about how we should not pray and then goes on to say that prayer is not I talked about this I think two sessions ago about how we should not pray and it talks about prayer not being babbling prayer not being a show for everybody to see and prayer not being a place of pride but a place of humility where we acknowledge that God is supreme and he's superior to us or any standard of the world but today the disciples asked Jesus and they're like Jesus well how then should we pray and Jesus says pray like this our father 
who is in heaven, or in other versions it says, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. It is a common prayer. We call it the Lord's Prayer for many of us who are Christians. Some stop halfway, some add more, some reduce. But today I just want us to go through one or two aspects of this prayer to just pick out lessons from them as to how we should pray. The first point we pick out here is the aspect of God as Father. It says, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven. The first aspect we must understand as into how we should pray is we must understand that we God, the God we pray to is a father. What does father symbolize? Father symbolizes relationship. It symbolizes covering and protection. It symbolizes authority. The word father in the Old Testament was actually a word called Abba, which was father or God in a relation to or personal intimacy. Father that we are talking about there talks about somebody you know, somebody you relate with, somebody you have a connection with. So I bet Jesus was trying to say that before you even start or before you even think about how you should pray, do you have a relationship? So maybe I pause here and ask you that question. You, the person who is understanding prayer, do you have this relationship with God? Do you have this connection? Do you have this intimacy? Do you understand who God is as Father? Many people know God as Lord, many know him as Savior, many know him as healer, many know him as provider. But there's a higher calling of knowledge of God, which is knowing God as Father, the one you have an intimate relationship with, the one who has the ability to protect, to cover, and the one who has the authority to perform that which he says that he will perform. Isaiah says it very, 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 very well in Isaiah chapter 64. If I can read that for you, the verse that I'm giving you here is Isaiah 64 verse 8. And the scripture says in 64 8, it says this very clearly. He says, okay, from verse 7, he says, No one calls on your name or stresses to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and made us waste away because of our sins. Yet, verse 8, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. And he continues to say, Do not be angry beyond measure, O oh Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. Oh, look us upon us as we pray, for we are all your people. Isaiah talks about the, you remember I uh, talked a little bit about how Isaiah speaks a lot about the suffering of the Israelites and even the suffering of Christ the servant. But he goes ahead to say that with all the pain and all the things that we've gone through, God, you are our father. You treat us from a relational point of view. Do you know that also knowing God as father means knowing the one who can rebuke? Because one of the roles of fathers is to actually rebuke and discipline. The Bible says God chastens us, says he rebukes us. He takes us through a straightening. Not rebuking to destroy but rebuking to correct us and to help us work on the right path so as you pray the first thing you need to understand is that God is our father who is in heaven not even here on earth because sometimes he keeps okay he's here on earth he's omnipresent but his his authority his kingdom is in heaven we'll talk about kingdom later but the first aspect we must understand as we pray is that God is our father he protects, he provides, he covers, he rebukes, he corrects, and he holds us in his arms. If you are watching this uh, discussion today, and maybe you've never understood what it means to have a father, or you have father wounds or father challenges or father issues you are dealing with, I want to introduce you to the ultimate father who is God, who is a father first of all to the fatherless and who can Feel every gap or every space or every neglect you have gone through as a result of not having maybe your biological father. God can hold you together as a father and can fill every gap and make you satisfied in that area concerning a father. So God is our father. We must understand that as we pray because your understanding of that means you engage with God on a relational level. Your engagement with God is not based on a transactional business arrangement, but it's based on a relationship. I think if there's one thing you will notice for the past few weeks that I've been sharing, that I've emphasized so strongly, is that the aspect of prayer cannot be divided or disconnected from the aspect of relationship. We pray to know God. We pray because we know God. We pray that we may know God. 
We pray that our relationship with God will be strengthened. That's the first most important thing for prayer. Prayer is not that we may get things from God. Prayer is not that we may receive, 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 receive. Even though we receive when we pray. But the, as the, the full big essence and understanding of prayer is that we may go in fellowship and knowledge of God. We pray to know God. So the first aspect here of how do we pray is that first of all understand God as Father. The second thing he says, our Father who art in heaven, we read that scripture there, or our Father who art in heaven, or our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The one hallowed actually means to be in reverence, it means to be in worship, it means to be in understanding, it means to be in deep awe of who God is. So the second point of how we pray is we pray in worship or we pray with worship or we pray worshiping God or honoring him or in reverence to him. Worship is the highest form of prayer. Why? Because it's kind of an intimate thing. It's something where you lose yourself for the glory of God to be manifested. Where you give up all that you are for all that he is. Acknowledging his superiority and looking at yourself as a frail human being that it is nothing or nothing without him. Worship focuses on preeminence and not precedence. It's not that we are putting God first, but is that we are saying that God is above everything else. He's first, above everything else. So worship is understanding or declaring the preeminence of God, that God is God and is above everything else. So how do we pray? We pray worship is part of prayer, in worship and reverence to God. So David and um, talks about this a lot in his Psalms, how he spent time in the presence of God, Psalm 24, I know, Psalm 64, he talks about it, how do he spend time in the presence of God, Psalm 27, how he spent time in the courts of the Lord, and he wants to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, rather than, you know, anything else, and he looks for that as the one most important thing, because David understood that the highest form of prayer really is worship. So we pray. How do we pray? We pray. Second step, first step, understand God as Father. Second step is worship and reverence to God. When God is exalted on his throne, when we understand that he's exalted on his throne, everything else can be easy or everything else fits into its place. The issue is when we exalt anything or anyone else, then it becomes really very, very hard for us to understand that God is God. He's superior, he's sovereign, and he's supreme. Hallelujah. I hope you're following together. So the disciples were saying, how do we pray? And you say, say, our Father, who art in heaven or in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your name is worth every preeminence. Your name is worth every supremacy. Your name is worth everything beyond anything else. John 4 talks about an engagement between Jesus and a Samaritan woman who was focusing a lot about worshiping at a venue and she was like what about if we worship on the mountain and you people worship in Jerusalem why is this a conflict and then God talks about worship and say worship is a spiritual thing that God is a spirit so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth so there must be a level of truth to your worship there must be a deeper connection not just physical but spiritual in your worship so when you pray there must be worship involved or you must understand that the worship of God is greater than worship of anybody or anything else. There's worship in terms of there's what we call perpetual worship, which has a lot to do with worship as a lifestyle, which is not public or private worship, which has to do with everything that we do every day should be in honor of God, should be the way we treat people, the way we live among people, should be, the, it should be, in reflection of the way we worship God or the way we see God in our lives. So the way you treat people will be also equivalent to what God's place or the preeminence of God in your life. So that's the second thing we see here, Christ saying as he's teaching his disciples, that you know, how do we pray? Worship God, worship him, exalt him for who he is. Use those words, use your life to make sure that, he see, that everybody sees that he is the God above everything else. And the third thing we see in the scripture, if I can go back to it again, it says, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. The third aspect we see Jesus emphasizing all in prayer is the recognition of the kingdom, the kingdom of God. Now the kingdom of God, there are very many teachings and series about it, which you can find maybe online or maybe at your church. I'll just say a few things about this. One is when we talk about the kingdom, that kingdom 
comes from actually that word king or the root word is the word king. You must understand that the kingdom is because there is a king. Without a king, we will not call it a kingdom. We'll call it something else. There are different forms of government. This one is that monarchy. Okay? So, the first important thing we must understand when we talk about the kingdom is that the kingdom is the king. Hallelujah. Especially God's kingdom. The kingdom is the king. So when we talk about the kingdom of God, we are talking about who God is. We are talking about his authority. And then at a third level, we are talking about the people or the subject of the kingdom who are those that believe in him and subscribe to him. So when Jesus is saying, your kingdom come, he's saying that as you pray, you must understand as you pray, you must recognize that there is a kingdom, which is not just this physical kingdom. There's a spiritual kingdom that is higher and above this physical kingdom. A, speech, a spiritual kingdom that God is the king and he has all the authority in this world. The Bible says he's omnipresent, he's omniscient, and he's omnipotent. He's all-knowing, he is everywhere, and he's all-powerful. He has the potential, omnipotent. He has all the power to do everything. So the kingdom of God that we speak of is the, the dispensation of God, the mind of God, the authority of God, the... the, 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 the power of God. And Jesus here is saying that as you pray, call upon that kingdom, that may your kingdom come. May your will be done here on earth. Now, who are the people? Who are the subjects of the kingdom? Okay, there's the subjects in heaven, the saints, the angels, and so on and so forth. But they are the subjects on earth who are those of us who are the believers, who believe in Christ. So if you believe in Christ, then definitely you become a subject of the kingdom, at least by choice. And a subject of the kingdom, the king has appointed me and you to be ambassadors here on earth, to be able to make sure that his kingdom comes on earth. The Bible says the same power that lives in Christ lives in me and lives in you. We as the loyal subjects of the kingdom are supposed to be able to make sure that the dispensation of the kingdom is here on earth in the way we treat people, in the way we exercise the authority, the ambassadorial authority that God has given us. They must be used here on earth. But we must, as salts and lights of the earth, like Matthew chapter 5 says, as salts and lights of the earth, to be able to show kingdom principles, kingdom lifestyle, and kingdom ways here on earth. People should look at us and be able to have a reflection of what the kingdom of God is like. People should see us and should be able to see and get a foretaste of the dispensation and the authority of the king. And the authority of the king can be used or can, is kind of given to us to be able to use on this earth. So Jesus was saying here, that when you pray, or how do you pray? Pray that the kingdom of God. Pray with authority of the kingdom of God. Pray understanding that the kingdom of God is and can be on earth by human works. Okay? By us doing it or by us taking the authority of God and implementing it as salt and lights on the earth. So how do you pray? Pray recognizing that the kingdom of God is here or the kingdom of God can be established on earth through his believers. And then, of course, as the Bible says, one day Christ himself will come and reign and rule on earth in physical, even though now he reigns and rules in spiritual and in, in our everyday living, but he'll come in person and we will all see him with our eyes. And the Bible talks a lot about that in Revelation. And I think Colossians also speaks a lot about the kingdom of God here on earth. And the next thing he says there, if we are to read it again, it says that a father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Now, here the Bible encourages that as we pray, we must pray with surrender or with the mind or heart of surrender that the will of God may be manifested in our lives what is the will of God it is not something you plan it is something you seek and only as you seek does God reveal it to you that's what Russell Kelfer says it's not something you plan or you have an idea of what it is it's something you seek and then as you seek it then God reveals it to you the will of God is the mind of God the will of God is the dispensation of God a lot of it is being revealed in his scripture so you can easily see it but sometimes there's the specific will of God like for someone's life or for certain things around your life 
That you must seek. You must understand, God, what direction should I take in this direction? And God can give you clarity about that. But the Bible says, as we pray, we must pray for the will of God to be done on earth. Not our will. We must surrender to that will. We must sacrifice to that will of God. Like we must give up ourselves to that will of God. It is very, this is sometimes one of the toughest parts of the Christian work. Because we always have what we want. We always want to hold on to our will. But Christ is saying that as you pray, let go of your will. And let the will of God be done. Let the ways of God, let what God wants be done here on earth. If you pursue the will of God, you can never go wrong because God sees the future. Me and you just see now, here, now, and we never know what's going to happen in the future. But for as long as you pursue the will of God, then you can never go wrong because you'll be in the direction, you'll be in the way of God. I'm not saying life is going to be easy. It will be really tough. It can actually be very hard. But the beauty about the will of God is that the will of God will always lead you in the right, you'll be always sure and convinced that you are in the right path and you will not have to deal with you know everything else about the wrong mistakes and things like that for as long as you pursue and seek the will of God. Jesus is saying here in Matthew chapter 6 that your kingdom come let your authority your dispensation be manifested on earth even through us believers even through you as God, but let your will be done. Your will be done is actually a response from us as believers. As you pray, you must pray with a heart of surrender, desiring the will of God to be done in your life and on this earth. As it is on earth or as it is in heaven, may it be done here on earth. May we not be ignorant, first of all, of the will of God. May we not be disobedient, secondly, to the will of God. And may we not put ourselves in, that, in a place of indifference where we know the will of God and fail to pursue it or where we do not give due cognizance to the will of God. Because as we pray, it's a key aspect of prayer. What is the will of God? Uh, there's a scripture I read a couple of weeks ago. I think it was about that we do not know how to pray, but the Spirit prays through us with groanings and what and things like that. We must understand, like, as I read it also in Ephesians 6, about us praying with the mind of the Spirit, that many times we pray all over the place because we've not taken time to know what the will of God is. Let me tell you, your prayer life becomes much simpler much easier when you understand the will of God. Because when you understand the will of God, then there are certain things you might not even need to pray for. You will just take steps of action. And there are certain things you know how to pray for or in the direction in which to pray for those certain things because the will of God is clear. So pursue the will of God and you get everything else. And the Bible actually says it very well. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all its righteousness. Then all these other things will be added. Seek first the mind. Seek first the king. Seek first his dispensation, his authority. Seek him first. Seek his will. And other things will be added unto you. So how do we pray then? Pursue the will of God. Then pursue the daily bread or then the daily bread he says your kingdom come your will be done i just read that scripture there your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven then there's a full stop there and it says give us today our daily bread um we rarely see Jesus praying for daily bread in the scripture. We see a lot of time Jesus actually just blessing the food. And when you read a lot of Matthew chapter 6, the Bible says, do not worry. Why does it say do not worry? It says the, the flowers are clothed. The buds are clothed. Like all these things, these natural circumstances around us, they're all sorted. They all have everything that they need. Why? Because God provides. So it's like if God can do that for, these, for nature, how much more us who are Christians, us who believe in him, us who are his precious, treasured creation, will he not take care of us? Will he not provide for us? He says, therefore, do not worry. So the daily bread here comes as a by the way and says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth uh, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. So yeah, it's not bad. It's not wrong to pray for provision, but basically what the Bible is saying here, if you've started the first three points, if you focused on God as Father, if you focused on worship of God as supreme, his preeminence, if you focused on understanding the authority and recognizing and obeying the authority of his kingdom, if you focused on what his will is, daily bread is a byproduct of the kingdom. 
daily bread. The Bible says well in this, uh, this same Matthew 6, when you go to 33, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all its righteousness and all these other things, which he talks about in these beginning verses, will be added. It's an addition. It's, a, it's, it's, it's like just a complement of the right mindset. So how do you pray? Your mindset must be right from the beginning. Understanding the preeminence, the superiority of who God is, what the kingdom is, what worship is, and then the daily bread becomes a byproduct. Yes. So when many times I see we do it the other way around. We first pray, God, give me this. I have no food. I have no fees. I have no this. I have no that. And we keep our needs and our requests and we put them all and bombard them. But trust me, I feel like Jesus was trying to encourage the disciples that sought the will of God, sought the kingdom of God, sought uh, the, the worship of God, so, you know, sought out the issues of God as Father. Sought these issues out. And when you sort these issues out, then the daily bread will have its place or the daily bread issues will be sorted too. Don't worry about these things like the Bible says. Pray, yes, pray to increase your faith, pray to encourage your faith, but understand that if you have sorted out the kingdom of God, if you've sorted out understanding God as Father, if you know what it means to worship God and there's always praise and worship on your lips and in your mouth and part of you, the daily bread part, is something that God looks at and he says, yeah, I will sort it out. You see, like I was saying earlier on, this aspect of the daily bread, many times as Christians, we kind of distort it and we kind of feel like that's all what prayer should be about. Request, 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 and request. But I want to let you know that in the mind of God, if we pursue him, if we seek him, if we run after him, if our prayer is focused on him, then all these things that we look for definitely are things that we'll get. God knows us. We are his children. He is our father. He understands that we have needs. Actually, the Bible says that even before we ask, God already knows. So before you even start asking, God knows that you slept hungry. God knows that your children don't have fees. God knows that you need new clothes, you need new shoes. God knows that you need school fees. God knows that you need money for to start a business and things. God understands. And as a father, he cares and he loves us. But the thing about this Christian work or the thing about the Christian life is this. We must put first things first. We must understand that we are relating to God. We are communicating with God out of a relationship, not just a business transaction. I keep saying this over and over again. And because we are doing this out of a relationship, the relationship will reach out or will bring forth these other parts of the daily bread, of the needs and the things that we have. So may you not be the kind of Christian who pursues the needs of or your needs more than you pursue God. Someone who pursues the hand of God more than you pursue the face of God. I love what David said that one thing I ask that I desire, Psalm 27, that I may seek you in your temple, seek your face in your temple to behold your beauty. So there's an emphasis on knowing God rather than it is on wanting to get things from God. And that's what Jesus is saying here. When you pray, remember our Father, His worship. Remember His kingdom. Remember His will. And then, then you can say, now God, my daily bread, as a reminder. And He knows too, but just as a reminder. And as we go on further to the scripture, if I may repeat again, it says, give us today our daily bread. Then he goes on to the aspect of forgiveness. It says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil one. The final aspect for today is really the aspect of repentance. And as we read further, Jesus says, and when you pray, say, uh, forgive us as uh, our debts as we forgive those who uh, you know, have sinned against us. And then as you actually continue to read further in Matthew chapter 6, he continues to spend a lot of time emphasizing, for if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. It first starts with the aspect of 
repentance, the aspect of us understanding that we as Christians, we are not always perfect. We always go through the ups and downs and we wrong others and we wrong God. But God calls us to be in the state, to be in a constant mindset or state of repentance. One of my best scriptures on repentance is actually Psalm 51. And in Psalm 51 is, 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 is David had wronged God. I mean, this guy had messed up. He had taken someone else's wife. He had stolen her. He had killed the guy. There was a child out of wedlock. He was the king. This was his subject and he had lost all moral integrity at that point he had murder all the in all the deadly sins you think about he had committed them just at one go but then david just realized his mistake and then he started talking to god in psalm 51 and says god in sin did my mother conceive me have been sin from birth have mercy on me you know according to your loving kindness show it unto me do not blot out you know he said blot out my iniquities do not hold this against me do not take your holy spirit away from me keep my communion with you keep my presence with you together don't 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 make me walk away from your presence he was so i mean he was so how should i say he was so particular about losing the presence of god that he did not want in any way sometimes when we do things wrong against god when we do things wrong against people it kind of sin like the bible says causes a division between us and god it causes a separation between us and god that's the beauty of repentance repentance is recognizing that you have done something wrong and taking responsibility for it two things recognize that there's a wrong taking responsibility for that wrong and how do you take responsibility you take responsibility by admitting it but then by turning away from it and not walking into that direction anymore the word repentance basically means a complete 360 should i say 360 or 90 a complete turnaround from where you are to face in another direction and jesus says when you pray say god forgive me remember to ask that remember the aspect of repentance being important in prayer we must live in a state as christians where we are repentant for the wrongs that we do against god or against people around us and he says we should forgive but also forgive others you know you might always ask you always say god forgive me god i've done wrong but what about forgiveness of others bearing with the pains and the mistakes and the sins of others and offering to them forgiveness jesus is saying when you pray your heart must be in a right state what does it mean by that like it must be in a state where you are repentant but also you're able to offer that same you know forgiveness to someone else your heart should be free from that heaviness uh, somebody says unforgiveness is that it's like drinking poison and expecting someone else to die because you are in that kind of state where you are bottling up you are holding on this grudge you're holding on this pain towards someone else and then you know for you you are suffering and that person might even be free a scripture i read one of these past few weeks about that before you come to pray first go sort out issues with people then you come to pray so that your mind is in the right state of prayer or so that you're free to pray without any grudge or any hard stone holding in your heart sometimes as christians we are easy and good you know to repent but we are not so quick or fast to extend forgiveness to other people but god asks us that as christians we should offer forgiveness as christians we should forgive other people people will wrong you i want to tell you they will wrong you every day of your life they will be on your nerves they will dance on your last neuron they will like they'll basically make your life crazy but you must offer forgiveness be gracious towards them the grace that has been extended to you through christ the grace that god gives you on a daily basis the bible says he forgives us our sins he heals us he does all these beautiful things for us may you extend that same grace to the lives of others so jesus said when you pray one be with a repentant heart when you pray two be with a forgiving heart be able to extend that forgiveness to someone else to be able to live at peace with your neighbor i mean prayer would not make sense if you have grudges prayer would not make sense if you have envy or jealousy in your heart prayer would not make sense if your heart is burdened prayer will make sense when you have let go of those burdens and drop them at the feet of god so how do we pray we pray when we understand god as father we pray and in worship and reverence to God. We pray when we recognize his kingdom and his authority. We pray and pursue the will of God. We pray for our daily bread, knowing that it's already provided. We pray 
with a repentant and a broken heart. The Bible says the sacrifices that God desires, Psalm 51, are a contrite heart and a broken spirit. May God teach you how to pray and may your prayer life move from one level to another. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for somebody watching today and learning more about prayer. May you encourage them. May you encourage them to know how to pray. My prayer for me and for all of us watching today is as simple as this. God, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to pray to understand you as Father, to understand your kingdom, to understand your kingdom authority, to understand and pursue your will, and to understand your desire for a broken heart, a broken spirit, and a, a humble heart. Lord, we bless you and we honor you. I pray for somebody who's watching today, who's going through whatever they're going through in life. Lord, may you take them through it. May your grace be extended to them. I also pray for someone who has unforgiveness maybe towards someone or something. May you give them the grace and the strength that their heart will be softened to forgive. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you so much for watching today's Tuesday Bible Study. I hope you've been blessed. Uh, this series are all on our Facebook page and also on our YouTube page at Gaba Community Church. So you can watch the, the, the topics we've done before because many of them are leading to the other and you'll get to know more about what God is doing and what God is saying. I want to encourage you that we have a Tuesday service here at 5 o'clock. You can be part live. I also want to welcome and invite you for our Friday prayer service which is at 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock and our Sunday Sunday services at 7.30, 9.30, and 11.30. We can meet 200 people in our church. Our church is big enough. We can see 200 people. So I want to welcome all of you to come and be a part of fellowship and be a part of what God is doing at Gabbard Community Church. Please, may God bless you for me, Sarge Voy, and the rest of the people here at Gabbard Community Church. May you have a blessed week. Please stay safe. God bless you, and bye-bye.